Copyright Amendment Act. We will be recording the session and send the link to you after the meeting, along with the contact details for Stephen and Pumla if you need it. I will begin by introducing our speakers, handing them over, and then we will do a question and answer session. To do the question and answer session, you're welcome to type your question in the chat box or raise your hand. I will revert it to the speakers and then we can engage from there. Ms. Nobantu Pumla Mfeka is an entertainment lawyer who has been engaged in the creative industries for approximately 15 years, having begun her journey as a contributing scriptwriter in South Africa as well as in the USA. She is a versatile entertainment lawyer with expertise in the various aspects of this law, including theatre, music, film and television. She consults with local and international clients in various industries, but focuses on the protection and management of IP rights in the entertainment industries. She is the co-founder and managing director of a legal consultancy, Global Entertainment Law. Ms. Mfeke is also involved in industry policy engagements, providing legal counsel, including recently assisting customers to formulate policy positions on the Copyright Amendment Bill, drafting submissions on behalf of clients on proposed legislative reforms, making representations on copyright reforms and partaking in discussions with the creative and cultural industries, as well as key stakeholders in government. Stephen Hollis is an intellectual property lawyer and partner at Adams and Adams Law Firm in South Africa, who specializes in developing brand protection and enforcement strategies with a specific focus on the African market. He is also a copyright and entertainment law expert who is passionate about the arts and the protection and advancements of the rights of creatives and cultural communities, especially in the digital space. Thank you and very impressive speakers this morning. We are very excited to hear what you say and we will hand over to you Pumla. Thank you. You're on mute Good morning. Again. There we go. Fixed it. Thank you. Um, good morning. Thank you for having me. Um, and just a quick disclaimer, my picture definitely that is not me. Um, we I've just changed computers this morning to make sure I have the best quality. So um I am a lady, <laughs> not the picture that appears. Um, but again, thank you for having us on board. It's such an important topic, um, which um, Stephen and I are both um, equally passionate about, not just as legal practitioners, but um, just as perhaps artists at heart. Um, so, you know, the South Africa's Copyright Amendment Bill, it has been buzzing in, in, in the space for some time, for a couple of years. And I guess the key question is that we want to really delve into is, what the enactment um, of this kind of um, legislation will have on investment in South Africa, the creative industry, um, and and if if indeed it will um, enhance or um, create some kind of trade barriers. Um, it's been a very um, tough, tough topic or rather to engage on. We've had deliberations for the last year or two, and I, I believe some of us practitioners for the last five years on the bill. And really the importance of it is because it, it, seem, it seeks to protect um, an asset of, of the intellect that most would know um, in the past in South Africa, we, we, we often were not really engaging on such topics. Um, so the Copyright Amendment Bill, um, is, as many already will know, has been um, set, was sent back by the President um, of South Africa, and when he sent the bill to, to from you know it was sitting on his desk for some time, and there was a lot of noise, sensational noise around what the bills um, were aiming to do. But the President then raised several deficiencies um, and made special um, reservations, which he had, including. Um, for example, um, tagging, which will incorrect tagging, which Stephen and I will go into a, a bit later. But what's most important is that for any investor, what we've come to understand, or at least what I've come to understand in my view, for any investor to feel confident to invest in any environment, one wants to be certain that the environment they, they indeed intend to invest in has one, um, an enabling policy environment, besides other um, exciting, you know, whether it's landscape, especially in, 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 the, in, in, in the sector of, of intellectual property. So what we find with this current bill, um, Stephen and I were engaging yesterday and we decided that we're going to have more of a discussion type setting for this morning um, because of, of recent developments. Prior to yesterday, we were sitting in a position where there was a lot of ambiguity in as far as where our policy and legislation was headed. We had high hopes um, and we still do um, in as far as, as the bill is concerned, and we were really just high having hopes that 
with what would be the outcome would be a decision made that say, that actually takes the the reservations which were raised by the president into serious consideration um and 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 decisions are made in re with regards to that um now south africa is at a time it, it, you know, I don't have to repeat it. it. It's kind of like singing to the to the choir that we had an opportune time where investment has, you know, the, the call for investment has been made. And especially in the sector, um, in the entertainment sector. Post-COVID, we've seen the changes that lockdowns and COVID have had on the industry. And it is a time to go back to the drawing board and reinvent ourselves and figure out a way on how to in attract investment into South Africa, taking advantage of the digital space that we find ourselves in. Um, it, it, would, it was unheard of in the past that we would have meetings uh, online and um, engage um, with the most comfort, but that's where we find ourselves in, which similarly then it is relates to how entertainment is being distributed and, and is being consumed by those that are our users. So we find ourselves at a, at a critical time when decisions like um, the one being made on the Copyright Amendment Bill have to be taken with the seriousness that they deserve. Because not only will it change um, the paradigm of the country if the correct decisions are made. In other words, if the correct decisions are made in as far as our policy is concerned, we will see a vigorous excitement towards investing in South Africa. Um, so I, I, I suppose from a legal mindset, the concerns that have been raised is that are we indeed realizing the impact that the changes to our legislation, um, specifically to copyrights, um, are we as, as a nation realizing the changes that this type of legislation will have in as far as investment is concerned? We have seen in the West, especially um, as, as you'd attest in America, how the entertainment industry has created a vigorous change in the economic setup of the country. And we have felt very strongly that in South Africa as well, we have an opportunity where content is 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 you know we we they, there's an overwhelming amount of content in this country, um, whether in the AV sector, visual arts, and it is important that such content is well regulated and well protected and, and well compensated for those who are content creators. So, which then brings me to the point of where where do we find ourselves? Um, so where we find ourselves now is really at a point where we are likely, um, and we I, I would like to be as frank as possible with this, but also as diplomatic as possible, because we have different investors that look at um, copyright and copyright protection. On the one end, you have you have investors that are interested in free access, or rather uh, easier access to copyrights, and then you have investors who are looking at um, rather having an investment and protection of that investment. In fact, if I had to maybe say it, we have yet to see investors who are interested in investing in South Africa who would want a regime of copyright protection that is not um, well regulated and protected. So what has transpired, just to maybe highlight and not to get too legal on this, but what the president raised as reservations in the bill touches on issues, for example, of tagging, um, how the bills were tag, tagged. And we have raised in, in, in our discussions and um, councils have put together opinions to show that these bills were incorrectly tagged and should have been tagged as, as um, Section um, 76 bills. There is also a key element, which the president also raises, on the lack of public participation and a public consultation in as far as this legislation is concerned. More specifically, in as far as economic impact assessment, we have yet to see a document which outlines how the impact of this bill um, will be felt by the different industries in the creative um, in the creative space, which is highly concerning because, um, as one would imagine, um, an investor, whether local and international, would want to ensure that any investment that is made, there is some kind of impact on how that investment will be will be um, realized in their particular industry. So we are sitting in a position where we are a little bit concerned in the direction of where our legislation is concerned is, is, is going. We sat in um, yesterday, um, Stephen and myself and other stakeholders, um, during the portfolio committee 
meeting that was held yesterday, which was aimed at um, narrowing towards a decision on what these bills would would what would happen um, with these bills. And sad to say, um, we we have to be very you know honest with this. Sad to say, it would appear that the majority are of the view that these bills need to be passed um, and and passed quite quickly which then goes back to the question in the beginning that we raised is, will this enactment establish an, en an enabling environment? And my simple answer for, as, as part of our intro is that if the bills are passed in the state that they are in, the environment is definitely not enabling because what it, what the, what it seeks to do is seeks to um, create an, a, an environment that is, does not give security to the investor of, in, in, in the copyright space. Um, so I think for now, I'm going to just leave it there and allow Stephen to come in and we've, 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 we'll then engage in more of a discussion around which areas are specifically of concern in as far as if the bill indeed is passed in the state that it is in, will an investor, whether local um, or international, be interested in continuing to invest in um, the creative industries or in copyright in South Africa. Um, and then just lastly, what, what is really unfortunate in my view, anyway, um, whilst balancing different interests is that we are a country which has to be looking at any kind of development um, as we did in the past towards how does that development um, actually assist the previously disadvantaged of our country to be able to become global participants in in their in their in their trade of of their culture. Now, if we are in a position where the, the space is beginning to open digitally for our previously disadvantaged creatives to take part in a, a exchange or trade of their cultural um, matters or cultural um, creations. And and we yet we are we are allowing um, you know what some have said uh, kind of tech environments to to be able to then engage or rather use uh, uh, the, 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 the these new innovations and creative and cultural creative without adequate compensation um, to those that have created or to those that are um, ultimately owners or holders of copyright. So without taking too much time, Stephen, I would like for you to maybe come in and then engage on the specifics rather of what it is that we have seen as concerning and if there's an opportunity at this juncture to be able to make any initiatives we would definitely appeal to our local and international stakeholders to come on board and what we welcome any engagements that um, investors would have to to see how we can kind of change the the tide to go in the direction that ultimately it should have Thank you, Pumla. Um, right, so let me see. Uh, am I audible to everybody? Yes, you are. Thank you, Annika. Um, yes, so uh, Pumla mentioned that we're slightly concerned with the uh, the situation re regarding the bills. She's uh, she's always diplomatic. Um, I would say that uh, that we're, we're deeply, deeply concerned as to where uh, uh, government is taking this process. We heard yesterday from the, the Trademark Portfolio Committee uh, after they've uh, taken uh, taken out about eight months to uh, to formulate a position on how to proceed after the president sent the bills back of, of on those six constitutional reservations. It was deeply concerning to to hear the presentation from the parliamentary uh, legal advisor, Ms. Charmaine van Amerwe, who basically said, look, uh, those are not real constitutional concerns uh, at all. Uh, uh, we disagree, I disagree. And it appears that the ANC has taken a similar uh, a similar stance uh, on the matter uh, and remain intent on actually processing the bills further, despite, as is, with, with very minor amendments. Perhaps the only amendment that will be made that was discussed yesterday is the retrospective application of the new statutory royalties that would be uh, uh, granted to authors and composers of literary and musical works, uh, uh, performers and audiovisual works, uh, and also authors of visual artistic works. Uh, I'll mention a little bit more about that in a moment. Uh, but, you know, when one looks at 
uh, why we've there's a real problem that has developed is the economic discussion has been missing from the uh, from the room, uh, pretty much from the get go. The reason I say that is uh, the bills when they were drafted were not drafted and informed on the basis of any economic impact assessment. So uh, the the DTI conducted a, a, a socioeconomic study. Uh, which uh, was focused on certain uh, socioeconomic aspects, for instance, the benefit of more free and uh, uh, open access to educational materials to developing countries, etc. What I'm talking about is something different. I'm saying if you introduce a legislative proposal that will have an impact on trade and investment and how business can be done in South Africa, then you have to do an economic impact assessment as part of a responsible uh, legal uh, law reform, legislative reform project. Uh, otherwise, you might end up in, in hot water, as, as is what happened in this case. Now, the, the, something to bear in mind about an economic impact assessment is that that assessment has to assess how each affected industry will likely be impacted upon. Uh, and what was patently obvious uh, during the August 2017 parliamentary hearings uh, on the bills in which I participated uh, in presenting to Parliament and some of the legal risks posed by the bill um, is that the, the drafters failed to really understand a number of very critical issues relating to how uh, uh, copyright functions and how business investment is attracted into the copyright industries and that the bill does not only regulate a single industry. The bill, by, by introducing one provision that might benefit a certain stakeholder, you could do serious damage to, uh, to another. So there was no appreciation. It was it was very much like a like painting with a broad brush over all industries, and without uh, realizing that you've got the publishing industry, you've got the the, the film industry, the audiovisual sector, you have uh, animation, uh, you've got computer programming, you've got broadcasting. These are dynamic and different uh, 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 sectors that that each have their own challenges and their own. Of, of, of let's call it contractual of, of, of frameworks and remuneration models that that these businesses that invest into these sectors know how to attract more business, especially for, uh, internationally. Now, what resulted, of, um, you know, from the from the fact that the the text of the bill was so flawed, uh, a week or so before those hearings, uh, DTI had a workshop uh, and it announced that. Uh, there was a change of focus from uh, from the initial focus of uplifting the plight of our local creatives uh, to transforming our law, as it was put, into a user access oriented system. And a lot of the proposals in the bill sought to do exactly that. It sought to weaken copyright protections. It sought to uh, to alleviate any obligations on uh, internet platforms to uh, to ensure that uh, against uh, infringements on their on their sites by extending. Uh, copyright exceptions, new copyright exceptions, fair use, uh, in addition to fair dealing, in addition to six new pages of exceptions where you don't need a license from the rights holder to use their works, uh, to extend those protections even to ISPs through a covert amendment of another piece of legislation, the Electronic Communications and Transactions Act. So there was a clear deliberate effort here to, um, uh, it wasn't just all by by mistake. And um, uh, what what sort of got lost in translation uh, in the background was uh, what's happening to creators and sort of to appease creators and performers. A number of provisions were 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 uh, inserted and proposed to um, to impress them, and a lot of those uh, uh, provisions, for instance, the new statutory royalty rights, uh, unwaivable rights for every single actor that steps on a set, uh, including extras, to receive a share of profits generated from every single film that's shot on location and commercialized uh, in South Africa and, and beyond. Um, an unwaivable royalty right, remember that. That means that these performers cannot choose or opt to choose for a different remuneration model. They will now need to start sharing in the financial risk of, of, of AV projects and they will likely receive less compensation upfront, especially extras. So there's so much 
there's so much that uh, thought that needs to go into, planning that needs to go into before you start drafting. Uh, it, there's no use in doing an economic impact assessment after the bills have been passed. And would you believe on the statutory royalties, for instance, um, uh, the drafters were so unsure themselves as to how this would work that they inserted a provision that says the Minister of Trade must go away after the bill is in, uh, in, enacted and becomes law and must go do his own impact assessment study to determine whether this is a good and feasible idea to say that on all projects, past, present and future, every single actor that has appeared in a film has to receive a share of further uh, commercialization works. Now, to be honest, in the film industry, uh, maybe not, uh, one out of 10 movies uh, turn a net profit and, and is a success. All the others uh, uh, struggle. A, a lot of works fail to actually make it past post-production. So if you place that financial burden on an investor, on a production company that, that brings investment or that has a business in South Africa, to on even their unsuccessful projects, pay out new royalties and, and, and money streams, it could see to a lot of production companies struggling to, uh, to keep their doors open um, and to attract investment. Now, where we are, and that's what's been highly frustrating, is the fact that um, these discussions on copyright often turn into quite an ideological discussion. Uh, the moment you debate copyright in parliament, you've got lobbyists who, uh, who act for, um, for tech companies who've, who've built successful business models on the unremunerated or unfairly remunerated uh, uh, exploitation of cultural and creative works. You've got saying that copyright uh, protection should be weakened. Uh, you've also got uh, persons who uh, who, who support the bill because it's going to give them a, a free access. Uh, and, and, and in some instances, it is warranted because copyright exceptions are necessary to an extent, but, it's, but it has to apply to very specific cases. And that is a, 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 you know, a principle that is enshrined in the Berne Convention, of, uh, an international treaty to which South Africa is also a member. So what's happened in a nutshell, and I know we've got very little time to, uh, to deep dive. We actually don't have time for deep dive. This is just a high level uh, overview. When you look at um, legislation that is going to affect trade, uh, you know, we've got a helpful guideline. We don't even have to wonder about it. Government has actually uh, issued uh, and and uh, approved a very important document in December last year uh, called the National uh, Policy De Development Framework. Um, now, this document is actually recognizes that in the recent past, many of our government departments have tried to do their best, but for some reasons, due to inexperience or other reasons, they've come up short in a number of key areas. One of them was identified to be a lack of meaningful, accurate uh, and uh, economic impact assessments on any provisions that will impact on trade and investment in South Africa. Now, if the copyright bill was to be processed from scratch today and the drafters were to start working on the act today, um, it would have been a deep ir irregularity for them not to do that. Now, for some reason, the, the absence of this economic impact assessment on each and every proposal that will affect trade in each of the subsectors, the fact that it's still absent is being completely ignored. The, uh, the, the view seems to be, let's just process these bills and deal with problems later. The, the, the big problem with that is it takes years to deal with problems later. And when investors have uncertainty, like Pumla so nicely uh, mentioned there, uh, they will not invest in high-level projects, the projects that can reinvigorate an economy, the projects that can bring not only uh, small amounts of investment on small projects, but, but big projects. I'm talking about $100 million projects plus, whether it's software development, whether it's uh, animation projects, whether it's a big feature film production in South Africa. And, and as South Africans, we've got a lot of reason to be excited because you know, there's a lot of international interest in uh, in, in in actually uh, uh, South Africa as a potentially a preferred destination for global destination for high quality content production. Um, and the big question is, and uh, like Pumla said, are you creating an enabling environment for that investment or are you creating uh, uh, concerns unnecessarily so? And are you creating a potential trade barrier? We know that it is uh, that these bills might lead to a potential trade barrier with uh, one of our 
very important trading partners in the United States. Uh, the, the Office of the uh, United States Trade Representative uh, has uh, started an investigation to determine because of a complaint that U.S. stakeholders raised. And these U.S. stakeholders are the, the companies that invest at the highest level in high quality content production, films, music, uh, and, and so forth. And they were saying uh, to U.S. government that it should be looked at because if these bills are enacted, they hold the view that South Africa's copyright regime would allow for so many new copyright exceptions and new ways that people can make use of works for free and in a very weak enforcement environment. We do not have statutory damages or punitive damages in South Africa that scares off infringers, especially those who seek to rely on fair use like in the United States does. Um, and and in that, in that sense, uh, another uh, a legal aspect that I think the drafters didn't look at is in South Africa, we've got a unique setup. Um, you cannot sue someone for damages unless you can prove their guilty knowledge. Now, if you introduce a U.S. styled fair use system, it's not even U.S. styled because it's just in name. The U.S. has appropriate checks and balances for that system and 150 years worth of case law that, that clarifies and makes it more specific. In South Africa, we don't have that. We don't share common law with, with America. So our courts cannot look to American courts to develop a fair use doctrine here where fair dealing is used and very specific cases of uh, uh, unlicensed usages are allowed. But uh, quite importantly, if you just introduce fair use without any real risk for the infringer who relies on it, uh, what, what we'll see in South Africa is the defendant would simply say, uh, I raise the legal defense of fair use if you sue him for infringement. And then it's up to you as the plaintiff to actually take that person to court to, to knock down that fair use defense. And if you do, after a couple of years and hundreds of thousands or millions spent, which none of our creatives can afford to, uh, to, to do anyway, and most companies can't do uh, our SMEs, you actually have a situation where at that point, the person will say, oh, okay, I understand. Uh, uh, now I understand before I didn't have guilty knowledge, so you can't sue me for damages, but let me pay you what a license fee would have been due. And in the end, the plaintiff would have lost out on uh, of all the legal expenses. You can't recover all your legal expenses, uh, maybe only a third of that in most cases. So there's, there's, there's a big problem in weakening copyright in South Africa without boosting of, of the enforcement mechanisms. And in the digital space, one of the, one of the, the main reasons that was put forward uh, policy decisions by government that uh, is updating the copyright laws is to bring it in line with uh, the digital era. Now, what we have uh, seen is that, as a matter of fact, number one, uh, the bill introduces the broadest regime of copyright infringement exceptions that the world has ever seen with an unbalanced fair use system, which is completely a field day for those who want to make use with and, and repurposing works without having to obtain a license to do so first. So, so that's, that's, that's one aspect. On the other side, in the digital space, uh, it seeks to introduce technological protection measures, which are which are not actually even, they could have copied and pasted the text from the WIPO copyright treaty on, on technological protection measures for digital products, but for some reason didn't do so and inserted quite uh, inept uh, uh, provisions that were criticized by, uh, uh, by uh, uh, WIPO senior director um, in, in a very constructive advice given to the portfolio committee to say, you need to tweak these provisions slightly, otherwise it may not even uh, uh, you know, it may, may conflict with, uh, with, with this treaty. Uh, and that was, uh, for some reason, ignored, together with the, uh, the, the expert advices uh, that were given at, just before the adoption of the bill that warned the, the, that warned that the bill is not going to pass constitutional muster, contains a massive amount of, of legal problems. So what you have is in South Africa as well is we've got no way to act against uh, foreign infringers online who infringes online. So whether it's piracy, anti-counterfeiting uh, or counterfeiting uh, 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 and so forth. You, um, in South Africa, if, if the defendant has, uh, 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 um, you know, does online infringement and doesn't have any assets here, there's no way to act against that person. So uh, proposals were submitted uh, uh, during the initial debates on the bill for, de for, for appropriate enforcement mechanisms to be inserted, whether dynamic site injunctions, as we've seen successfully relied on by rights holders uh, in France, in, 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 in the UK, Australia, Canada, 
um, and uh, or, or even site blocking. And all of that was just flat out ignored. And that's where the COVID amendment uh, that, that came in of the of ECTA that I mentioned was so interesting. So on the one hand, you say, no, we don't need to improve enforcement. Let's actually um, give uh, uh, technology companies and internet platforms uh, and ISPs more leeway uh, to make use of without remuneration and with less obligation to avoid infringing uh, proliferation of infringing content by its members. So. While the, uh, one of the biggest issues facing uh, creatives, especially in the music industry, has been the free use of their materials by billions of people around the world online who sign up to internet platforms um, without paying a subscription fee that goes to, uh, directly to the artists whose works are featured, which led to the value gap uh, that is so hotly debated in a certain, uh, like the EU. Um, our creatives in South Africa need more from government. They were promised more. They were one of the main reasons why this whole process began. It wasn't only to update our laws to meet the digital, um, uh, the, the challenges of the digital age. It was also because a group of musicians went to the office of then President Zuma around 2009 and said, please help us. We, we're really struggling. Um, and what has happened in this case is there's been a shift in focus from helping the creators to uh, changing to a user access oriented system uh, to to just sort of uh, uh, tie up um, uh, from a from an investment perspective. Um, it is absolutely critical that uh, I often think of, of four main pillars of investment uh, that that in my experience in dealing with clients uh, of what they look for locally and internationally. Pumla's already mentioned the first one. You need legal certainty. Now, some of these provisions and new uh, uh, proposals that I mentioned briefly, the, the new statutory royalty uh, systems, for instance. Um, if, if there's no certainty about how this is going to work, do you really expect that people engage in those industries, whether audiovisual, music production, computer program development, um, are going to appoint people from South Africa, especially internationals, uh, are going to actually look to appoint a uh, do projects here at a time where they cannot do a, an accurate financial um, a layout ahead and plan ahead. We know with full budgets, or with all budgets really for projects, you have to be on the money. Now, if you know that there's a sword hanging over your head, that in, in two years time or one year time when this bill is going to be enacted, that you all of a sudden need to start paying out uh, monies on past and present and future works. We don't know how much money. We don't know whether it will be determined on net profits only or on any profits that you generate, even on 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 projects that have not yet uh, yielded a, a net profit. Uh, it's 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 not really uh, rocket science to determine that you might chill your investment in, for in those uh, on those projects for South Africa and move it to another country that has an enabling environment. That's something South African government needs to realize is that our creative un, uh, industries holds the key to post-COVID uh, economic recovery because we've got major international interests in bringing major projects to South Africa if the uh, regulatory and legislative environment assists them to protect their intellectual property assets, assists them to enforce those intellectual property assets, and allows for contractual flexibility. Um, and, and these bills will do exactly the opposite. Um, there's a, there's a particularly nasty provision in the copyright bill. It's called a contract override provision. It's another world first that was dreamed up by the drafters that says uh, the beneficiary of a, of, of a right in terms of this uh, uh, bill cannot waive it contractually. So if any benefit that you receive, you will have it. You can't assign or waive it. Now, when you look at uh, the 25-year assignment that the bill places on uh, literary and musical works, right? Um, I can't see any South African scriptwriters, um, uh, South African musicians appointed to do the score for a new international film or the script for an international film, for instance. Even locals might look to set up their film production companies in Mauritius or Nigeria because after 25 years, it re the rights revert back no matter what your contract says. So all of a sudden, you lose the right to further uh, to, to in, you lose certain rights in a multi-authored work, and that's another key 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 area that uh, that was not understood by the drafters of the bill. They kept on uh, during the August 2017 parliamentary hearings. Uh, some MPs kept referring to Solomon Linda and the, the lone artist who uh, sat against a, you know a, a tree and wrote a, a, a song and sold it to a record company for 
very little, and eventually the song made a lot of money. Of course, that is a, a case that that has a, that that bears a lot of concerns. But nowadays, works are created differently. The high value of uh, investment works are not see a, a lone artist sitting somewhere and and coming up with something. It's teams of people. It's sometimes hundreds of people. It could be thousands of people. If you think of video games. Uh, if you just look at the credits at the end of the, the of, uh, of it or the movies, uh, you look at music. Uh, one of uh, Lana Del Rey, I looked the other day uh, at one of her songs, uh, how the rights have been allocated. Has, uh, on one of her new songs, she had uh, 12 songwriters, uh, 12 composers, and I think six different producers. Now, if you can't unify rights in a project in the producer of that work, so that they can on-sell it uh, uh, to a distributor or to a, a client, you, you're actually not going to attract investment at all in high-level uh, content production because unification of rights is key for the value of the product. You can't sell it to someone and say, by the way, um, in, in a couple of years, you probably will start losing uh, 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 the, the, the ability to further commercialize it if it's a successful work. So all the big money that you're going to spend to market, to distribute, to reach the right target markets will probably just um, uh, you'll have to you'll have to just withdraw the project uh, from the market. Um, and and uh, uh, sorry, but see, we're running out of time. But um, Another of uh, rights reversion. So with rights reversions, and I heard this also too often in the debates uh, in Parliament, is that, yes, there's, there's rights reversion for musical works in the United States. Yes, that's true. Is that reversion the same as South Africa? No, it's not. It's much more sophisticated. You need a sophisticated uh, a set of provisions dealing with uh, reversion rights if you go to reversion rights, if you want that. And uh, uh, the United States uh, uh, Copyright Act is a brilliant example of an excellent uh, 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 framework for that, which allows for a very structured approach in which uh, as, as a, a songwriter or a musician can potentially get their rights back if they feel that they did a bad deal uh, or whatever reason before. But if that song is included in a multi-authored work, you don't you, you forfeit that right in respect of that work. So you can't actually at some point in the future stop a film from from continuing to use your uh, the song that was played somewhere in the movie because you want another 10 million dollars now um you know at that stage um so the unification of rights of, of you know and and also on the performance bill and this is my last comment for now um dealing with rights reversions so the performance bill does a lot of good stuff it's got it's got less issues uh, i would say especially constitutionally than the copyright bill. Of course, the copyright bill is much more complex and regulates many more industries. But the performance bill could potentially be fixed up faster uh, in Parliament even um, if, if there's an honest uh, and constructive uh, intention to do so. Um, but one of the major issues with the performance bill, for instance, is that uh, it basically has this 25-year reversion of economic rights uh, for each and every performer uh, featured in a sound recording um, after 25 years, right? And it has a, it also has a, a, quite a problematic transfer of rights to the producer of an audiovisual work. So once again, you get with a you, you uh, there's a problem with the unification of rights in a, in a work for the life of the project for on selling to um, uh, purposes, and. Um, you know, the 25 year, even though the introduction of the moral rights for performers and the economic rights for performers are absolutely top class, that's laudatory, and it's in line with international developments. And as we've seen, it's the same rights as included in the Beijing Treaty um, on uh, audiovisual, which uh, uh, 30 other countries have now entered into. So that's fine. But the Beijing Treaty doesn't go that far to say after 25 years, each and every performer featured in a sound recording will get all these economic rights back. Now, what that means is all of a sudden you've got conflicting rights to the company that's invested in the creation of the, the recording. And you can actually prevent the further commercialization of the work, which affects the value of the product. Now, and that's bad for everybody because the, that's bad for even the performer as well. And if you look at the very broad definition of sound recording, um, you'll see that even an actor that makes a sound that's recorded and it's included in a film might be afforded that same 25-year reversion clause. Now, when one looks and considers at these risk factors, and these are just some of them, there's also some other problematic ones like 
the statutory uh, parallel, parallel importation approval of that. So that's quite problematic for territorial licensing and also for um, selling at different prices for different markets. So if you feel you've got a certain product and you want to sell it in Zimbabwe for a reduced price um, because of the, uh, the poor economic state of the country, uh, you better watch out because somebody else can buy it at that price, bring it to South Africa and sell it um, and, and actually compete with you with your own projects because there's an exhaustion of rights that's, that's recognized in the, in, in, uh, in the bill. Um, uh, and so ultimately, uh, you know, when people are interested in investing in high level projects, they look at risk. They look at whether they can potentially recover their investments. What are the risks for them not doing so? What are the risks for them not owning the rights to their intellectual property assets that they create during the, uh, the project? And what are the risks for them not being able to enforce their rights uh, uh, effectively? And uh, when you look at South Africa and what these bills do, uh, and you get a group of lawyers around the room, whether in Australia, whether in the UK, whether in America or Canada, and they sit down with their client, whether a software uh, a company, whether a, um, a film or music company, and they look at the risk profiles. These big projects very seldom go to just one country. We want to do it there. It's a whole host of factors that's looked at. And when South Africa's um, representative or person knowledgeable on what's happening here looks at that, well, they will advise the client and say, you should probably for the next three years move that project um, you know, to, to these countries uh, to avoid these risks. We are at the moment in a red flag zone because of these bills. And if they're going to be processed, uh, I would not be surprised if the USDR's investigation, which is ongoing and which is which is actually not mentioned in Parliament uh, during the Portfolio Committee meeting, it's very oblivious. It's almost like, don't worry, these bills are great. Uh, the president clearly didn't have a clue what he was talking about. Um, that's, that's the message that came from the room yesterday, which was quite shocking and disappointing to me. Um, and because they're all legitimate legal concerns. Um, uh, and uh, you, you've actually got a situation where the economics trade is not uh, an investment aspects uh, have not been properly considered. And there's a there's a, almost a, a disregard for um, for potential consequences once the bills are enacted by by adopting a stance of it's OK, let's just get these bills off our desk for now. We'll enact them and we'll deal with problems later through regulation or new uh, legislative interventions. Unfortunately, investment doesn't work like that. But like I mentioned previously, projects are planned in advance. And you know what? It's maybe a horrible thing to say. But if you look at um, the dire traits of our creative sectors during COVID, I, I wouldn't be surprised if that would continue from an investment perspective. We won't see big new projects coming in if these bills were enacted. It, these bills in its own poses a pandemic risk to the creative sectors. Um, and at that, I think I have uh, a better rest now because clearly um, I'm getting quite excited about the topic. So um, uh, uh, Pumla or Anika, back over to you. Um, thanks, Stephen. Annika, if, if that's OK, before maybe you take on, I just I wanted to maybe add a point, um, a key point, perhaps to qualify, not really to qualify, but to give a little bit of background, which many may already know. Um, and, and the reasons perhaps why we find ourselves in a, in a position that we do now. So traditionally, South African performers have cried out to government and Stephen mentioned this, but I just want to reiterate the point. Um, so that we can understand why we're sitting on these two opposite planes. Performers, South African performers cried out to government to get assistance as Moenia were notably dying as poppers. So that, you know, um, is really the, the genesis and the history behind why government then took it upon themselves to say, how do we fix this situation? How do we um, assist to protect our local performers from um, the infringement or the exploitation that continues to take place? Um, now, the, the sad reality is that when you are protecting performers, you cannot protect performers at the detriment of creative, um, so, you know, content creators or copyright um, owners. So what, what I've observed in my view in the deliberations is that that narrative, um, even on, on public platforms, you know, radio, when we are invited to engage, that narrative is obviously quite strong as performers are, are, are South African performers are not protected and um, they need uh, uh, adequate protection. But what I've 
come to realize is that there's very little understanding on the principle of copyright um, in that a performer has to perform what is has already been created, which is copyright, and that copyright has to have been adequately protected for any performance to actually take place. So it, it seems that there is a definite um, disjointed understanding in the two aspects of these two bills. So the one protecting the performance, which as Stephen um, says, is quite uh, applaudable and we have to encourage that. However, these bills are intertwined. So you can't protect performers um, while ex you know, infringing on the right of, of copyright um, 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 owners. So I think the, the, the background is, is very important and going forward, we need to strengthen that argument to government that Performers will not have works if investment in the country is not made, um, especially in the AV sector, if you know blockbusters are not coming to South Africa because investors in that space are afraid that their works or their um, their copyright is not adequately protected. And what it does, in fact, it, it continues to perpetuate the lack of performing or lack of performance protection because there will be ultimately not much work to perform. So that's very important. Um, also, we will recall a few years back that there was an announcement towards free education and free access to education. So there is a strong stance, I believe, on in our government position that access to education means access to copyright. But in what it what that does is, you know, free access to copyright actually discourages any content creator or any writer, any author to put works together or to put together any kind of books that when they know that there will not be any compensation um, to them. And um, I think just maybe lastly to add to that, I think this discussion is so key because not only is it touching international stakeholders who are looking at investing in our country, but we have had a lot of local um, stakeholders who are, uh, are quite upset with the direction that it's going simply because at this point, how do you take out any new innovation and ideas out of the country when you know that locally there is not adequate protection? So I think we have to come to a point of as, as, as legal practitioners, as investors on, on how do we stop this tide that seems to be going quite rapidly, um, in my view, in the wrong direction. Um, and like Stephen said, according to yesterday's meeting, we are almost convinced that the decision has been taken specifically by the ruling party that um, these bills should proceed, should be passed. Um, there is also, like Stephen also mentioned, an idea that should be passed so that at a later point they can be fixed, which we know um, that regulations do not really fix um, an act that is ultimately invalid or unconstitutional. So what I think is likely to take place in the next few months um, and, and years to come is, is a quite a, a vigorous engagement on one end, but also um, a litigious journey. Um, we do see that happening. Um, most investors are likely to pull out on investment. Those who are concerned with, are likely to pull out and those who are willing to um, engage deeper in the this, in this subject are likely to fund um, a constitutional battle um, in as far as these bills are concerned. So just to wrap up, is South African Copyright Amendment Bill um, will it will the enactment establish an enabling environment? The currently um, the the answer is probably unlikely to um, enable an environment for investment um, for the creative industries, which would be a quite a sad reality at a time when we are reinventing ourselves towards a digital space and a global, you know, what we call global, um, a global local environment. Thanks, thanks, Anne. Thank you so much, Pumla and Stephen. And th this is such an important topic. This bill has been so controversial in since its release. And it, it's a nice lead up as well to the IP summit we are planning to host on the 17th of May. So we're going to be splitting this into two sections, one with business and then the second with the ministers of health, higher education and training, so science and technology and um, trade and industry, Minister Patel. Um, and we do have the chair of the Copyright Coalition 
Coalition who will be joining us as a panelist for that session as well. It's a very, very important topic that we do need to take forward and sort of partner as business together to engage governments on how we can find a workable approach that is beneficial for all. And I thank you both so much for your time this morning. We do have a few more minutes extra. If anybody would like to ask any questions or make any comments, please feel free, type it in the chat box, raise your hand and we'll revert it to our speakers. Is everybody okay? It was the session self-explanatory. Please, we welcome your engagement. All right, I think I think you and Stephen provided such a sobering effect. Everybody's still trying to come to terms with it. There we have a comment saying very informative. Thank you. So what I suggest is to give you a few minutes back of your day. I will send a recording of the session out along with the contact details for Stephen and Pumla. So if you do have any comments, concerns, queries, you're welcome to raise it directly with them after the session. Again, thank you so much, Pumla. Thank you so much, Stephen. Uh, we appreciate you taking the time to address us on this. Um, please feel free to reach out to me if you would like to um, book a spot for our IP summit that's going to be taking place on the 17th we are hoping to sort of form a business partnership in where we can raise the importance of ip and protecting ip along with copyright um, to sort of take forward to governments in a proactive engaging way um, so that that will be on the 17th online at two o'clock um, please welcome contact me thank you everybody for your time this morning and have a great day thank you Thank you, Annika. Cheers, everyone.